or your TA Serenity is sleeping with her eyes open right now. It's super creepy and scary. Just like NTU effectiveness method heat transfer problems. How, how's that for a segue? So heat exchanger problems using the LMTD method are actually super chill and easy and normal. It's really only the effectiveness NTU method problems that students usually don't like very much. But if you can get past the new terminology and the sort of weird creepiness of it, the problems are not actually that difficult. And in fact, there are a lot shorter problems than a lot of the convection problems that you'll also see in this course. So I start off by just reading through the problem and just writing everything down on the picture because it's easy to miss things and it's just a lot easier to find everything on the image. Probably the most confusing part is the cross-sectional area, the one meter by one meter. On the picture, like the figure on the page here, it really looks like the side that the tubes are in the direction that the tubes are going, that looks like a one by one square. Whereas the direction across the tubes where the hot air is flowing, that looks much wider than one meter, like the one meter height and the one meter width, they, those don't visually look the same. But remember that the cross flow of the air, the air is going in that direction. So even though the figure doesn't look like one meter, uh, in, in the horizontal distance, that's the distance that has to be one because that's the only, that's what, that's the direction the air is going. That has to be the cross-sectional area that the air is traveling through, not the cross-section that the water is traveling through. Now we're trying to find for this problem the outlet temperatures and the rate of heat transfer Q dot. So since we're looking for outlet temperatures, that's how I know that this is an effectiveness NTU method problem because LMTD, the easier method for heat exchangers, that can only be used when you know at least one outlet temperature. LMTD is useful when you know outlet temperatures, like what outlet temperature you wanna hit, and therefore you can solve for the size or the dimensions of your heat exchanger to get the exit temperature that you want or know. This NTU effectiveness method is used when you know your heat exchanger. In this case, we know like the number of tubes and we know the overall heat transfer coefficient, but you want to find the exit temperatures for the given heat exchanger. Heat transfer problems always have assumptions. We're gonna assume steady state, so our mass flow rates are gonna be constant assume constant properties so that our CP value is constant. So normally specific heat would change as temperature changes, and this is a heat exchanger, heat is being exchanged, temperatures are changing, CP should be changing, but that will make the problem way more complicated, so we'll assume a constant value for CP. Also density, in this case for air, because as temperature changes, density should also be changing. We'll assume a constant value for that, and we're also gonna assume whenever we use the effectiveness NTU method, that the heat exchanger is kind of small, which is going to allow H and U to be constant. If the heat exchanger were really big, then the heat transfer coefficient would actually probably be different in different parts of the heat exchanger. So assume that it's small so that those values can be constant also. So I'll start off with the FE reference manual, just the equation right at the top for effectiveness, Q dot over Q dot max that's equal to the effectiveness. And Q dot max is not listed in the FE reference manual, but you can find it in any textbook. It's the minimum value for capital C, the heat transfer rate, times T hot in minus T cold in. So this is the maximum possible drop or rise in temperature. So the hot inlet air can only drop down to the cold inlet it could never drop further down. And the cold inlet temperature could never rise more than the hot inlet temperature. That delta T of the both inlets is the maximum change that either stream could ever go through. We're not saying that anywhere in the heat exchanger that there is that difference in temperature. So this is not like a UA delta T, this is, Capital C is M dot CP. 
So this is the T hot end to T cold end is the maximum change that either stream could actually have. And now this heat transfer rate, this is the capital C for the cold fluid would be M dot C and then CP C and capital C sub H would be M dot CP for the hot flow. So for the cold flow, we were not given M dot. So we have to actually calculate this. We can use, think back to like fluid mechanics, rho A V density times cross sectional area times velocity gets us mass flow rate. And I'm just gonna go ahead and make a guess here for the density um, because we don't actually know what the outlet temperature is gonna be. Um, I'm just kind of guessing that we'll get 997 for density, right? I'm assuming an average temperature of 25 degrees Celsius, like maybe it's coming in at 18 and leaving around 30 and averaging around 25. So I'm gonna grab density at 25 Celsius of 997, but that's something we'll have to check at the end to see if that was actually a good guess. So cross-sectional area, we were given a diameter for each pipe of 0 0.03. So pi over four times diameter squared, but then we also have 80, 80 tubes. So 80 times the diameter of each tube gives us cross-sectional area. And the velocity, we were also given three meters per second. This gives us a mass flow rate for the cold flow of 169.1 kilograms per second. For the hot flow, this is a gas. So we'll go back to the ideal gas equation, PIV-MERT. <laughs> so M, I'm gonna rearrange this. M divided by V is density, right? Because we're looking for mass flow rate, rho AV, density, cross-sectional area times velocity. We were given that cross-sectional area, one meter by one meter, and we were given velocity for the flow, 12 meters per second. So we're really looking for density. So rearrange the ideal gas law, density equals P pressure divided by RT. The pressure was given 105 kPa, and I can look up a value of R for air of 0.287, and then my temperature is gonna be the 130 degrees Celsius plus 273. I have to convert this to Kelvin in order to make my units cancel out. I also had to be really careful since my 105 is in KPA, my 0.287 is also in kilojoules. So the Ks here, the kilo terms will also cancel out. And this will give me a density of 0.9078. And I can plug that back in with the cross-sectional area of one, velocity of 12, get 10.89 kilograms per second of air. And so I was a little inconsistent in that I assumed that the water was going to change temperature when I used its density, but for the air, I assumed that it's not gonna change temperature. I just used the 130. I didn't use like 125 or 120. So again, we'll check at the end as to see whether that was actually a good assumption or not. But I now have enough information to calculate the heat capacity rate. This is the capital C, the M dot CP. So for the cold flow, 169 times 4180. For the hot flow, 10.89 times 1010. I get a heat capacity rate of 706,000 for cold and about 11,000 for hot. So the 11,000 is gonna be the minimum value for capital C. 706,000, the maximum value for capital C. The ratio between those two, either just capital C by itself, you might also call this CR for heat capacity ratio. The minimum C divided by maximum C, the 11,000 divided by 706,000, uh, 0.01556 is capital C, also sometimes called CR, heat capacity ratio. And so it might have made more sense if I had actually put the effectiveness equation up on the screen first to show you why I am finding these capital C heat capacity ratio and NTU values that I'm gonna find next. 
but it's actually you're gonna have to find these every single time. Every NTU effectiveness problem, you're gonna have to find capital C, you're gonna have to find NTU. It is the number of transfer units, it's a ratio between UA and M dot CP. And a larger value for NTU means that we are closer to this maximum possible amount of heat transfer. The maximum rate of heat transfer is gonna be happening when we have a really high overall heat transfer coefficient U and a really big heat exchanger with a lot of surface area, um, a lot of time for heat transfer to be happening. This also is gonna be reached when we have a really low value for M dot CP, right? If the mass flow rate is slow, then each molecule of water will spend a longer time in the heat exchanger, which means it has more ability to change temperature. And if the CP value is small, this means that for every given unit of heat being added, we'll see a larger change in temperature. So NTU value being large is gonna mean we're closer to the maximum possible effectiveness. And a large value for NTU is something like five. Five NTU is really high. A small value, basically anything less than one is pretty small for NTU. And when we plug in for this problem, our UA of 130 for U and our surface area is the outer surface area of the cylindrical pipes. So pi times diameter is the circumference of the pipe times the length of one, and then there are 80 of them. So that gives our surface area divided by the minimum value for C. So whichever flow has the minimum value for heat capacity rate is gonna be the one that changes temperature the most. That's the one we're interested in. So this is the 1099, not the 700,000. We get a value of NTU once we do the calculator work, 0 0.089. This is a very small value for NTU which gives us a little bit of a preview that we are not gonna be very close to that maximum possible heat transfer rate. So we're finally ready to find effectiveness and there's two possible ways to find this. One is gonna be with an equation, one is gonna be with a figure, and we're gonna do both because the equation will be more accurate, but the figure is gonna be really quick and easy, um, but it's gonna be less accurate. So we'll actually use the accurate one in our equations later on, but we'll look it up in the figure just to check our answer to make sure that we didn't make like a calculator mistake. So my textbook has a big table full of effectiveness equations for all different heat transfer, uh, heat exchanger designs. So whether it is parallel flow or cross flow or mixed or shell and tube. So for a cross flow single pass heat exchanger where one flow is mixed and one flow is unmixed. And specifically with the minimum heat capacity mixed, which in our case was the air, the air is mixed, but the water is unmixed. And that is the one with the maximum heat capacity rate. For this specific style of heat exchanger, we get our equation of one minus E to the, all of this junk that you see on the screen here but we already solved these values, right? I kind of cheated and, and, and knew what we were gonna need. This one over C, this value C is sometimes called CR, the heat capacity ratio, and then NTU, which we also found. So when we plug in all of these numbers, we get a value for effectiveness of 0 0.085. And now that's kind of coincidence that this happens to be the same as NTU. The NTU is also 0 0.08. Those numbers do not have to be equal to each other, right? This effectiveness is a value between zero and one. It's like a percentage. Whereas NTU is not between zero and one. Again, a value of like five is pretty high for NTU, but it can definitely be greater than one. It's just coincidence that these ended up being about the same. But now I can also jump over to the figure. So I've got my NTU of 0 0.089, and I got my value of C of 0 0.015. And when I look these up in the figure, it looks to me like, it's really hard to tell. Like right at this, it's, I'm really kind of guessing here, maybe like 0 0.07, uh, but either way, it's something pretty low. So our 0 0.085, that makes sense, right? That looks like it's, it, it, that could definitely be right. 
And if you've been keeping your eye on the kitty cam, you can see that Serenity has actually closed her eyes a little bit. Maybe this type of NTU effectiveness problem is not quite as creepy, not quite as scary anymore. It's still definitely kind of weird, but now maybe that we've gone through it once, you start to be like, okay, I, I could do that. I don't fully get it. I don't maybe understand everything about it, but I, I could do this. I can look up the equations, I can plug in the numbers, and then maybe the understanding will come a little bit later. But at least finishing the problem is, is really straightforward. The hard part is done. The weird hard part is like the NTU effectiveness part. Now that we're just doing regular heat transfer stuff, this is the easy stuff that, that you know, you definitely got this. So Q dot is equal to effectiveness times Q dot max. And we already found all these terms, the effectiveness 0.085, our minimum heat capacity rate, 10,999, and the maximum possible delta T. Our T hot in, minus T cold in, so 130 minus 18, we get 105,000 watts or 105 kilowatts. And again, that maximum change in temperature, 130 minus 18, we're actually not, probably not getting anywhere close to that delta T because our effectiveness is so small, only 0.08. But now we can calculate exactly what that exit temperature is. Now that we've solved for heat transfer rate, Q dot, we can solve for the exit temperatures. So M dot CP delta T, but M dot CP is just capital C, the heat capacity rate, the 706,000 that we already calculated, times the delta T cold, so T cold out minus 18. And with 105,000 for Q, we actually find that the exit temperature is only 18.15 degrees. So this heat exchanger, its purpose is not really to heat up the water, right? The water is barely changing temperature at all. So my guess at the beginning was actually really bad. I guessed that the outlet temperature of the water was gonna be like 30 degrees. That was a horrible guess. Fortunately, um, the difference in density would only be like 998 instead of 997. So I'm gonna go ahead and say that that's close enough. I am not gonna go back and recalculate everything, but if you wanted to be perfect, maybe probably that, that would be the perfect way to go back with 998 for our density and redo it all. No, close enough. To calculate the exit temperature for the air, same rate of heat transfer, 105,000 watts. We can use heat capacity rate for the air, the M dot CP for the air, the 10,999, and then hot air inlet 130 minus hot air outlet, which is the value of T we're trying to find, we get an outlet temperature 120.5 degrees. And it makes sense that the exit temperature for the air was a much bigger change than the change for the water because the heat capacity rate for water was humongous, it means it takes a huge amount of heat transfer to get a small change whereas the heat capacity rate for the air was much smaller. So for a given amount of heat transfer, you get a larger amount or it takes less heat to change temperature. So if you're starting to get it, but you wanna see another practice problem to try and reinforce this effectiveness NTU method, I've got another NTU video linked up on the screen for a different style of heat exchanger to give you a little bit of extra practice if, you wanna, if you're on a roll and you wanna keep going.